Hello. Welcome to Hanging on His Words. You are welcome here. My name is Ken Heidebrecht. And tonight is going to be a fun live stream because I have a, a kinship with our guest tonight. He's a brother who's, you know, just encouraged me for many years in the faith. And um, since we met, he's just been someone who I've looked up to and want to emulate my walk after. You know, when Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, the implication with what Paul was saying there is that he walked like Christ did. So why not walk like he does? And I believe that this brother that we're going to have on is like Paul and like Christ. So, yes, I'm looking forward to bringing him on. But before we do that, I want to just acknowledge the presence of our virtual ecclesia, the house of God. Run Boston Bear. This will be a great chat. Shalom. Thank you for joining me tonight. Dean General salutes to the chat. Can't wait. Anticipating a great show. Yes, it'll be a great show. Sister Tracy Jones is in the house. Hey, sister. Wow, have fun. Let's all like, share, and invite. Yes, if you guys wouldn't mind. You know, if you you like what we do here at Hanging on His Words and over at uh, Ministers of the New Covenant, give us likes and comments and all that fun stuff. Or hit the thumbs down. I mean, either way, it gets the algorithms kind of going. So we would really appreciate that. Abigail. But visual, sorry. Oh boy, this is going to be interesting. Looking forward to it. Yes, I am as well. Sister Donna Porter says, Shalom, everyone. Going to be a great discussion, y'all. Marsha, Shalom. Shalom, sister. Thanks for joining us. Sister Payne's in the house. Thank you, sister, for joining us. Sister Carmela Lazarus, Shalom, all. Yes, Shalom to those who, Shabbat Shalom to those who are celebrating Shabbat this evening. And to those who will wait a little longer and do it in the morning, watch alone to you guys as well. Country Dad is here. Hey, Matt. Thanks for joining us tonight, brother. Appreciate you. Say hi to, uh, to Sam if she's around. Maybe she's in the chat. I haven't got to her yet. Who else do we have in here? Sister Wendy Van Hoor. A lot of sisters in the house. It's great. Watch alone, brothers and sisters. Sharon Mayran, hello everyone. This will be a great one. Yes, I think so. I'm biased, but I think it'll be great. Anytime you talk about biblical cosmology, I mean, it's just a fun time. I've geeked out on those discussions for many years, and they really don't get old. How can they get old, right? This is this is the setting. This is the environment that the Father placed us in. It's exciting when you realize what he actually says in his word about it. It's amazing. Brother Bob Cleveland, shab. Are we short forming it? That's cool. Maybe it'll catch on. Shab to you as well. Mr. Jeff Porter, Shabbat Shalom from Under the Dome. Yes, Under the Dome indeed. All right, a couple more here, and then we'll uh, we'll get started here. Hunter, you have no idea how perfect the timing on this was. Oh, good. Great. I hope uh, I hope this does something for you. This this timing. I hope it adds to your life in some way. What else we got here? We got to catch up to the chat here. God, the Son, Jesus Christ saves. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining us this evening. Brother Tyler's in the house. Greetings. Future immortals. Yes. So many amazing things to be looking forward to. And that's one of them. Future immortality. I'm really looking forward to that. Mary Slattery. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Hello, sister. Thanks for joining us tonight. Carla is in the house, Carla Mulberg. She's here. All right. I guess that means we can get started, right? We got to wait for Sister Carla to show up to get started, guys. Iron Mike's in the house. Good afternoon. Is this Mike Tyson, Iron Mike, or is this someone else? I'm assuming it's not the actual Iron Mike, but, you know, who knows? That'd be cool if Mike Tyson was watching my live streams and was like a closet biblical cosmologist and he's, you know, just coming out now. That'd be cool. All right, a couple more here. Geo Truth. Okay, this is a brother that I am going to be having on in the future. He's a genius. Brother George Newber, Shabbat Shalom family. It was a great Kingdom Crew presentation by Brother Matthew Jansen on how he came to believe in biblical cosmology by using Yahweh's scriptures. Yes. Yes, so and that's basically what we're going to be discussing tonight. Matthew's journey to biblical cosmology and his awesome documentary that he made. 
And uh, yeah, brother George, we're gonna get you on. This this brother is uh, very technical. He's he's needed in this community. Uh, he can do a lot of cool things with math and numbers and angles and geometry and all that stuff. And I'm definitely looking forward to having him on because it's important that we can show the world that we're not just you know blindly believing things. We need to back things up with methods, scientific methods, and and things that the fathers provided smart people the capability of you know understanding and portraying to those of us who aren't as uh blessed in that area so yes look forward to him coming on i think we'll do a couple more here i know i said that twice but enjoying the truth daily iron mike run boss and bear okay these two guys are hitting it up in the chat daniel kalami or kalame sorry if i didn't pronounce that right shalom welcome Eternal Lights here. Faithful Functionary is my favorite song from Break the Sky. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. It's not my go-to genre of music, but I wanted to throw something a little different in my last album. All right. Country Kid is here. Hey, sister. Welcome. I love the country folks. They're great folks. All right. All right, guys, so I'm going to start by playing just a little clip from Brother Matthew Jansen's documentary. And here it is, I believe, yeah. I was invited by one dear brother, Brother Sean Griffin of Kingdom in Context, who has been very influential in my journey towards this understanding of cosmology and on the panel discussion there were five of us and i was the only one that didn't adhere to flat earth not that i was totally against it or for the globe i was just kind of neutral and i told him that ahead of time i said i don't know what i'll have to add to the panel and he said i'll come on anyhow and he's never shunned me he and i don't agree on every matter of doctrine in the bible but he's never been anything but kind towards me and so he's been a pretty good influence on me wanting to look into this doctrine further. I can go back now and watch that two hour discussion and I can glean so much more from it now in 2023 than when it took place in 2020. Sometimes it's just not your time to see something and that's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you stupid or dumb or anything like that. Sometimes we need to put something on the shelf and when it's time, we can pick it back up and what was cloudy and gray all of a sudden becomes clear and crystal. You know, when you seek, you find. Don't start knocking on a door if you don't want the door to be opened. It's amazing how many people that I've met, and when I've asked them, hey, where are you at on cosmology? They look at me and they say, flat earth with a dome over top. <laughs> All right, so that's Brother Matthew. And without further ado, let's just bring him on here. Hey, shalom, shalom. Man, brother, thank Love you for it. joining me, man. This is a celebratory <laughs> event, I feel. Yeah, you know, this, is, this is awesome. It's uh, awesome, brother. It, it's great. Matthew, I had to share something real quick before we really get started here. Luke 15, 7, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one person who comes to the truth of biblical <laughs> cosmology than over 99 others who already believe it. <laughs> Luke 15, 7. <laughs> I love this it. is a joke. <laughs> really? I love it, brother. I love it, brother. Yes, well, brother. brother, you were you were one of the influential people in my life about this. And it wasn't just the uh, the truth of being a biblical earther. I've started to say now, instead of flat earther, I tell people I'm a BE, my yeah. BE brothers and sisters, but it wasn't just the truth, but it was the method. And I like to tell people that a lot of times the method is just as important as the message. And we could go through so many verses. Second Timothy two twenty four is my favorite. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle, able to teach patient in gentleness or meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. So your method, brother, was spot on it was great you've always been very kind and, and loving towards me and you never considered me anything but a brother um and hey you've been a blessing brother ken 
And so I'm so thankful that I, I can see this now. Um, I'm thankful for, you know, not being alone in this. People have told me, they've said, well, Brother Matthew, you know, you were brave for, for coming out and, and telling people you believe this now. And I guess in some ways it takes some bravery because I've received some pretty bad kickback mm -hmm. from some people. But you don't say, buddy, you don't say. No, <laughs> but, you know, I think about like Brother Rob Skiba, who I didn't know and never watched or listened to until probably 2020. And um, I made a playlist now on my YouTube channel of videos that have been influential studies that have been influential to me in regards to cosmology. And I've got one of his on there. It's almost a three hour presentation. And I think it was from 2015, 2014 or 2015, when a lot less people were believing this and he received a lot more vitriol and kickback and hate for sticking with the scriptures rather than what man would say, you know, he was letting man be a liar and Yahweh be true. Mm -hmm. He was kind of like a, one of the trailblazers, I think from what I gather in my studies, one of the trailblazers in modernity for this uh, belief uh, in this truth. And a trailblazer has to go down a trail and cut back the briars and the branches and move the sticks out. Yeah. So the rest of us. Yeah. yeah. When I got to the trail, it was already clear. Brother Rob and Sean and Ken and Wes and different ones that I've listened to, they've already blazed the trail. So it was pretty easy. I already had so many Facebook friends and TikTok friends that were biblical earthers already. <laughs> so it wasn't that difficult. It just took time to study. I don't like to jump into something until I study it out for myself and uh, can tell somebody why I believe what I believe. So thank you, Brother Ken for being a good influence on me. Yeah. Hey brother. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. It's very easy to do that to you because again, you're, you're just a, uh, a very humble, wise, prudent, um, well mannered person. Like you're just, again, you're someone that I just, uh, I look up to and respect. I really do. I, I consider you like an elder in the faith, even oh. though we're we're pretty close in age. You know, yeah, we are. We you know, are. I, I'm not a, I'm not able to grow my beard out and show some of the the gray strands in it quite yet. Yeah, but um, yeah, we're pretty close in age. So, yeah. Okay. So, brother, this um, I, I'm look. I remember looking back at one of the episodes we had you on. I can't remember exactly which one it is, but it's in your documentary. And for those who don't know. Brother Matthew Jansen over at Ministers of the New Covenant YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Also, you have a website, Matthew. These are both linked in the video description for those of you who are interested in checking them out. I I adjure you guys to do that. Check Brother Matthew out. He's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. You released a documentary. And this is kind of where, where we're coming from with this live stream is that you had released this during the, uh, the Kingdom Conference, the virtual conference that we had sure. a couple weeks back. And, uh, yeah, it was awesome. And in that documentary, you kind of spliced in this conversation of Sean and I and Wes and a couple other brothers. Um, and we had asked you to come on too. And I remember that evening I was thinking like, even before we went on this show, I was like, I'm pretty sure Matthew's not a hundred percent there with this stuff yet. And, and Sean was just like, it's okay, let's, we're going to have him on. And um, I was like, oh, man, I really hope like I, I, I wanted you to become what I'm trying to say here is I wanted you to become a biblical cosmologist full <laughs> and through. I was like, come on, Lord, like, let's what, what do we have to say? How, what, what needs to happen for this brother to, to get there? Because it's so life changing. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and, and when I watch your documentary, it's you know, it's true. It was life changing for you as well. Yeah. And like you said, you, you kind of put it on the shelf and then you decided to take it back off the shelf and really examine, become a brand like the brands in act 17 and yes, you know, see what, what all the fuss is really all about. Is this stuff in scriptures or not? Did the, yeah. did the our ancient brethren actually believe this stuff or not? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 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 That's, that's kind of how it went. I started looking at it in 2020 shortly before we were on that show. And, um, I was kind of neutral on it at the time, but I was open, you know, I never, I never did shut my mind off to it. I first heard about it in 2015 and I just kept collecting everything people were sending me, putting it in a file on my computer and until eventually I would get around to it because it takes time to study things. I mean, I think somebody should 
probably set aside at least a good six months, you know, before they start bad mouthing this particular doctrine or coming on Facebook and trying to destroy people's comment thread sections <laughs> yeah. that are talking about this, spend a good six months just really researching it, trying to start with a blank slate, go to primary sources mm. um, and, you know, just look and see, look and see. And I think you'll be surprised. I know I was because um, when I got around to 2022, I hit it hard and studied it for about a year and I believe this way since 2023 around Passover, um, 2023, I pretty much settled in my mind. So when brother Sean asked me to be part of the kingdom crew conference, I had already had this idea mulling in my mind that I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I guess the big different part was I had the idea of including a lot of the brothers and sisters that had contacted me or that I had seen on Facebook when I would throw a little bit of, sheep food out on facebook about cosmology i saw that <laughs> i mean you intrigue a lot of people yeah. like i remember the first the first post you did on one of those i was like yeah. sweetie i went to my wife i'm like i i think he's there i think yeah. he might be there like it was you left us like just intrigued right it's like a cliffhanger it was like from that those yeah. conversations we had it's like yeah. where's matthew jansen on this where is he at really on this and yeah. then all of a sudden he like, like you said you throw out a little piece of little piece of meat for us dogs right to, yeah. to gnaw on and it was uh yeah it was awesome to see all these brothers and sisters were saying you know they would go from atheism to theism or from nominal christianity to uh torah christianity and i was like man you know this is just amazing so we got to get these people on on video and get it out here and that's what i tried to do mm. and to me you know to me that was the that was the most special parts of the documentary, not my teaching, but the testimonials from the brothers and sisters that were just down to earth, heartfelt. I just asked people to get their phone out, just give a quick, you know, two to three minutes of their testimony. And I think it turned out really, really, really good. Not just because I put it together, <laughs> but because the people were involved and, um, I've gotten a lot of good positive uh, from that documentary. I've gotten some negative, but I, I honestly don't think the negative have come from people that have sat down and watched it and, and really yeah. taken it to heart and did, and did the study. So um, yeah. Yeah. the knee jerking happens mm -hmm. a lot in this topic for yeah. sure. For sure. I, I have a couple of videos, as you know, um, on my own channel regarding biblical cosmology. And I would say the vast majority of it is, received well like the comments are like yeah yeah this is amazing yeah this has enriched my faith and it's giving mm -hmm. me more faith in god and i've come to you know like you said like to understand the torah through this and mm -hmm. you know you get the odd like you're you're insane you need to be locked up in a padded room type stuff and i just laugh at those comments you know at first it was like oh man that doesn't that's, oh, that's not nice but yeah yeah after a while you start to laugh and you start to think like you know, I understand where they're from. When you're that indoctrinated into the world yeah. systems, you know, um, of I do. It's foolish. Yeah. I, I, let me say this, and I don't want to sound like the grandfather here, which I, I am a grandfather, <laughs> but this sounds like something maybe my dad or my opa would say. But we've got to remember when we're discussing with people online, and, and there's a whole, there's studies that have been done on this, but we tend to lose that person to person or face to face communication yeah. and people are people. They have feelings, man, different color eyes, hair, they, they cry, they laugh. And when you're talking to somebody online, you need to take extra care, um, to be, to be kind, you know, portray the fruit of the spirit, love, mm -hmm. joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, th those things. And you have a, a really, Excellent looking fruit basket, I must say, when it comes mm. to that type of stuff. You really do. Well, praise the Almighty by His Spirit, His power. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of Matthew. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very thankful that His Spirit has influenced my life in that regard. Um, so sometimes I use all my patience on everybody else. And then when I get around my family or my wife or my children, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm impatient and I, I need to work on that. You know, we should speak to our spouse better than we speak to, to anybody else. So yeah, it's good um, advice. Good marital yeah. advice for those of you who aren't married yet. Take that yes. one, write that one down. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled 
it is life changing. I look at creation different than I've ever looked at it now. I'm completely persuaded, 100% on board. And it was the scriptures that did it for me. That is not knocking somebody that comes at it from a scientific or mathematical or whatever aspect. Mm -hmm. But I'm a Bible man. If I can see it in the Bible, my wife and I, when we got married many, many moons ago, back in uh, early 98, we decided together we were going to believe the scriptures um, fully. We're on board with it, no matter what anybody said or thought about us. Um, and that's what convinced me. I got into the scriptures, uh, specifically Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, and, you know, various parallel or accompaniment texts. And it was it was mind blowing, brother. I mean, I thought when the first time I heard this, I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to be mean about it. But hey, this is this is probably not right. But <laughs> then you get to looking at it in the, in the scriptures and you're like, wow, the scriptures do teach this. The Hebrews did believe this. And then you you keep tracing it uh, a little bit further out and you find that the early Christians believe this. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a I have a book in my library about um, science, cosmology and Eastern Orthodoxy and many of the what what is what are called um, in Christianity, the church fathers. Uh, they they believe this, preach this, taught this. Even the Protestant reformers like John Calvin and Martin Luther, they all they all agreed with the firmament there in Genesis one six through eight. And so I'm I'm reading all this, and then I'm realizing that the the globe heliocentric globe model is what is new and fresh and not ancient and you know not that old at all. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, you know, why are, why am I why am I believing this instead of believing what the the ancients believed and what is what is found in Scripture itself? So praise Yahweh for his for his scriptures, like the other brother said. Yeah, exactly. Now, if I'm correct in saying this, you were a, a geocentrist for several years before coming to the the full understanding of biblical cosmology or what you currently understand. Yes. Is that correct? Correct. Since around the year 2000 or 2001, I was presented with geocentricity. I remember it because of Y2K. I don't know if anybody remembers that <laughs> far back, but we were oh, storing yeah. food and all that kind of stuff. So I've been serving Yahweh to this capacity, understanding his Torah and, and keeping his commandments since 1997. So um, I remember there was a brother that presented. You're almost us. an OG, brother. You're almost yeah, an OG. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so my wife, my wife, she's this is all she's ever known. She was raised this way, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, geocentricity was presented from Joshua 10, Psalm 19, Ecclesiastes 1, and Matthew chapter 5. And, you know, there's so many other texts in, in the scriptures as, as well. Um, I think Genesis 1. Uh, teaches geocentricity uh, when you really slow down and, and, and read it. Yeah. Um, also, obviously, fixed stationary earth, you know, enclosed cosmology as well. But but yeah, so I was already I wasn't really vocal about it, you know, and, and have it been. Um, I guess I'm a, I'm a more vocal about it now since the documentary. Yeah. <laughs> but you yeah, put it, was, it out there. The interwebs have have grasped yeah. a hold of it. So now there's no going back, brother. Yeah, take it or leave it, you know, whatever. <laughs> but but I mean, it's it's it is what the scriptures teach. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to try to spiritualize it away or say everything's a metaphor there. And, you know, when when Joshua commanded the sun and the moon to stand still and then the next verse, the Holy Spirit inspired. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped, you know, and I know all that, you know, well, that's really the earth that quit spinning and all that, which I don't, yeah. I don't know how that would affect. I mean, if, if the earth was spinning at the rate that they say it is, and then all of a sudden it stopped, it seemed like everybody would get thrown off to me. The larger but, miracle would have, would have been to stop the spin of the earth. If, yeah. If what they say as how fast it's going, it would have completely destroyed everything on the earth. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so I mean, that, and that text, and then of course, you know, the other text from Ecclesiastes Psalms, Matthew five, where Yahweh sends the rain and he makes his sun to rise there in Matthew 5, 43 through 48. So, um, yeah, and we came to that belief just from being presented with the Bible verses. We were presented with the Bible verses. My wife and I looked at it. We said, yeah, this is what the scriptures teach, so we're going to believe what the scriptures teach. We don't care what man says, what science claims, um, what some atheist with a stack of degrees says. Yeah. We believe Holy Scripture. That's all our eggs are in that basket. And we're, we're, I'll die. You always will that way. Mm -hmm. um, when I stand before the creator, if he asks me, you know, why did you believe 
um, the sun moved and the earth was fixed, I would take him. I'd say, well, you know, one of the scriptures is Joshua 10. I read Joshua 10 where your anointed prophet, uh, he commanded the sun and the moon to stand still. You said that it stood still. So I, I believed it. Mm -hmm. I'm a lot more comfortable with that than trying to twist it and say it means something that it doesn't actually say and explaining that to the to the creator. I, it doesn't make any yeah. sense to me. So I'm, I'm sticking with the with the scriptures here, here. Here, here. Yeah, that's that's the childlike faith, right? Exactly. Like it's right. the text says the sun and the moon stopped. Then, you know, if I'm a child, if I ask my child or someone who's young and an infant to read the text and, you know, how do you understand that? Well, the sun and the moon stopped. Mm. Right. It's that simple. And so when you truly get a grasp on biblical cosmology and what the scriptures have to say about the luminaries and the sun and the moon and how they're performing their own circuit in the firmament above and they do it every 24 hours and they faithfully, you know, run their race, run, you know, that circuit. It, it makes things a lot, uh, in my opinion, more easy to understand his word. And you can you can accept it for what it is. You know, yes. that's what I literally see when I'm out walking about my day, you know, on a nice summer day. And I see that sun. Yeah, I see. I watch the sun move. Right. Yes. The, it can be as still as can be outside, yes. you know, not a yes. wrinkle in the leaf. Yes. Uh, and the sun will move across the sky and you can see that that thing's moving and that I'm not moving. Yeah. Right. I mean, so it's a, it's amazing brother. And before we pull up some scriptures here, cause we must go some, to some scriptures and talk about some of this stuff, you know, Genesis yes. one, six to eight and all that. Um, sure. Was there a aha moment? Can you, can you put your finger on an aha moment? Like where you're like, Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Or was it just like an evolution of, you know, various passages coming together, forming kind of an amalgamation of this idea in your heart. Like, how did you have any like, yeah, oh, I did. wow, like being epiphany type thing? Yeah. So I have this book in my library by Ben Stanhope, <clears throat> and um, he was interviewed by the dude on Myth Vision, which I think is an atheist now, he used to be a Christian, but atheist now. But he likes to interview um, different beliefs. I think he interviewed Dr. Heiser, you know, a while back, back in, back in 2020 on, on demonology and things like that. Well, Ben, ben Stanhope is, is a scholar and he, in, in his book, um, misinterpreting Genesis, how the creation museum misunderstands the ancient near Eastern context of the Bible, something like that. That's a long title. He has a chapter in there. When I was reading the book, he had, had a chapter in there, um, about, uh, heavenly cosmology and then the cosmology of the earth. And, Ben, while he subscribes to what modern day science claims, he tells you that that's not what the Bible teaches. It's not what the Hebrews believe. The Bible teaches in a fixed solid dome over top of a flat stationary earth with shale underneath and waters surrounding the structure. So I think the video, <laughs> I was reading the chapter and then I pulled his video up and he titled the video, the earth is flat in the Bible, get over it. <laughs> and i would I'm encourage you every, there huh? <laughs> yeah everybody needs to watch that because this is what i found that was my aha moment when i when i was just seeing him interpret the scriptures exactly the same way that biblical earthers like you and brother sean do and he's saying you know i you know i don't believe this doctrine of accommodation yada yeah. yada yada but this is what the scriptures teach and I was like, man. And so that was the aha moment. And then I found that it was pretty much un un unanimity, if I'm saying that right. It was unanimous mm -hmm. across the board, like 98, 99 percent. Let's say let's leave some wiggle room yeah. that everybody who studies this for a living um, and ancient Near Eastern cosmology agrees. Uh, I pulled up some articles by a guy named Paul Seeley. I I'm not sure if Paul Seeley has died or not, but he wrote a two part. Uh, series about the waters above the firmament back in 91 okay. and Paul Seeley spent, he was a graduate of Westminster theological seminary. He spent 20 years, 20 years studying Genesis one through 11. Wow. He came to this understanding. This is his understanding of cosmology in the Bible. Um, uh, a guy named John R Roberts, who I tried to get on my YouTube channel. He, he said he doesn't do video interviews, but, you can pull up all of his articles that have been in biblical journals on cosmology. I'm working through one. I have it right now. It's a 36 page article. Hopefully people can see it, 
but it's about the miracles in the Old Testament that demonstrate an ancient cosmology. Cool. He talks about the manna from heaven, um, Exodus 24, where Yahweh is standing on the sapphire stone. Um, yeah. uh, Korah and his followers. Uh, do you believe that was literally up. Yahweh? I do. Yes. Yeah, me too. Do you do believe that? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I just saw, I think I just, I just watched your video about Yahweh's body uh, mm -hmm. the other day. Oh man, I loved it, brother. <laughs> oh, I loved it. It was great. Awesome. <laughs> it was yeah. so good. It was so good. Um, but I'm working through that article right now by Roberts. He's another one. He He's an ancient Near Eastern scholar that studies this and says, yes, this is what the Hebrews believe. This is what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible verses mean, mm. but we can't go with it. And you scratch your head and you wonder, how can scholars do that? But see, I ran across this years ago with the name Yahweh. Every single Bible dictionary or scholar that, that you pull up, they'll acknowledge the creator's name, his divine name, Yahweh, but they won't use it. They'll go to church. They won't push that it gets used in songs when they sing or when it, a preacher preaches from the pulpit because for whatever reason, it's just not important to them. But they'll acknowledge the truth of what scripture teaches. And that's what I found here with cosmology across the board. They're acknowledging the truth. Every lexicon, every dictionary. Every single one in my library that I have, and I have a, a pretty big library, said the exact same thing when it came to the firmament and the earth and Sheol and the waters above the heavens. They all admitted this is what the Bible teaches. Yeah. And so I'm like, you know, this should be everybody should want to believe this. But, you know, we get excited about truths and then we try to present them with people and people are just it's just not their time or they're not ready or. They're too married to the heliocentric globe model or they're they're They want to put their faith in what science claims and their faith in man. And I'm just not, I'm not comfortable with doing that. Um, I was thinking yeah. today, brother right. Ken, but before we move on, I was thinking today about numbers 14. Okay. Where the 12 spies were sent into the land of Canaan to spy out the land. And, you know, 10 of the spies came back scared to death. They said, there's giants in the land. We can't take these guys. But, you know, Joshua and Caleb, they had a different spirit and they said, we can do it. Well, the 10 spies came back doubting because what Yahweh had promised didn't seem feasible. It didn't seem tangible to them. We can't defeat these giants. So th there's no way that we're going to try to take this land. And I think that's what people are doing when they're they're not believing the Bible. Mm -hmm. They're believing what man tells them or somebody says, well, I've got this picture or this video showing this or this or that. And they get their eyes off of the Bible. They start leaning on the arm of flesh. They're trusting in man. When Proverbs three, uh, five, six and seven, I think it is, says trust in Yahweh with all of your heart. Do not lean into your own understanding and all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your paths yeah. and then be not wise in your own eyes. Mm -hmm. Fear Yahweh and depart from evil. So if if a million people are saying one thing and Yahweh is saying the other thing, you stick with what Yahweh says like Joshua and Caleb did. They said, we believe Yahweh. We trust Yahweh. It may not seem feasible in the human mind when we look at these giants that we can defeat them. But Yahweh said it. We believe it. And that's all that matters. That's Every what I've time. done. Yeah. Every time you, you rely on what the word says. I agree. It doesn't matter if there's a million people, like you said, saying one thing and one person saying another. That one person is Yahweh in his word. That's I'm right. going to go with that. That every time is going to trump it. And brother, I'm going to just uh, share the screen. We're going to pull up just a little snippet in your video where, where you and uh, another brother are looking at Michael Heiser and how he's presenting it. Because Michael Heiser is, you know, he's a very big name in uh, yep. biblical scholarship, right? Like he ancient semitic language expert uh like you said he's written several books mm -hmm. um had podcasts like he's a, a renowned scholar in the christian community so yeah it's worth hearing what he has to say right yeah all right let me just pull this up here hmm. you see that brother it's there yeah yeah okay. i smile this when i see it three-tiered cosmology there's god we're going to see it in the verses i'll show you that god lives above the vault of heaven firmament and in the firmament you have windows and doors and you have the earth we're going to see verses that talk about the ends of the round flat earth here underneath it is shield shield can be both the grave and it can also be the underworld 
it's, it's not quite hell, but it's sort of like hell. We can talk a little bit about it. And then underneath that, we have the great deep. These are all scriptural terms that are on this map. This is yeah. what an Israelite, an, Egypt, an Egyptian would have had different terms, but the same three-tiered level, same with the Mesopotamians. Now they have, theologically, they have dramatically different views yes. of what's going on here. Not just who made it, but what's going on. Views of afterlife, the value of humanity. I mean, it's, it's dramatically different. And I've made the comment before, Genesis is about theological messaging. And there are some dramatic differences in what Israel is saying, the Bible is saying, and anything else. So let's take a look at the parts. Waters above and below the heavens. Listen to this, people. Genesis 1.6, God said, let there be an expanse. Some translations have firmament. It's rakia in Hebrew. In the midst of the waters. And let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse, the rakia, and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And what was that expanse called? Heaven. Mm -hmm. The heavens, the sky, Shemayim in Hebrew. So mm -hmm. here is the sky. And you have waters above the sky. And of course, you've got waters below down here. But you have you know, the atmospheric heavens as well. Psalm 148 mentions the waters that are above the heavens. That's after the flood. Did you catch that? Because a lot of people want to say, oh, the waters above, they went away with the flood. See, the, 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 the firmament was this canopy thing, and it was there, and then the flood, it just went away. No, it wasn't. Mm. Yeah. So, Brother Heiser, uh, you know, may he rest in peace in, yes, in Sheol, yes, you know. Yes, yes. And uh, he did a, a great work with this presentation because uh, Rob Skiba, um, who was, you know, instrumental in my understanding of this stuff, he, uh, you know, he would refer to Michael Heiser's work often in his, you know, a lot of times it was to say, look, he's he's the guy, right? He's what a lot of people go to if, you know, you want to refer to an expert, he's the expert, and this is what the expert is saying. Yep. Yet the expert is also saying it's, you know, the doctrine of accommodation because we can't, we know through science and, you know, video evidence and modern yeah. technology yeah. that obviously this can't be. Right. However, the, he's very sincere and honest, like all most scholars, like you said before, the majority of scholarship will say, oh, this yeah. is what, this is what the Bible describes. This is what the Hebrews believed. This is what a lot of ancient cultures believed. Yeah. Yeah. minor minor differences but a lot of it was like pretty much the same stuff right yeah so <laughs> it's there it's in your bible these people that have all the the name the letters after their names will attest to the fact that this is what the bible says now do we believe it or do we say no we we know better now right. we know better now and that's this is where i think one of satan's biggest deceptions that he's pulled off in all of history at least the history of humankind since Adam to where we're at right now. I would say this is one of the biggest deceptions he's perpetrated on the earth is, yeah. is you know, our modern high priests in the white robes of, of scientism who tell us this is what it is now. And yeah. therefore it casts aspersions and doubt on this ancient Bible, this ancient, you know, work of, old you know goat herding individuals who weren't mm -hmm. wise at all right and so mm -hmm. it's worked unfortunately this this mindset has crept into the body of christ for too long and uh, i think there's going to be a revival with this this type of stuff where it's going to get people going back to the plainly written words of of scripture and putting their faith in what it says and saying you know what i'm going to shut the tv off mm -hmm. i'm not going to listen to people who were part of the occult telling mm -hmm. me what what the truth of the reality of all creation is oh, i'm not going to listen to people who you know would prefer to worship hasatan over the god of all creation right yeah. I, i'm going to put my faith in the other person the one like we said earlier who created all things mm -hmm. reveal it to his prophets and the prophets faithful faithfully recorded it for all of us that's right so. let me tell you something brothers and sisters if you if you're not on board with this yet you you're already actually denying what modern day science claims when you believe in a creator 
there yeah. there are people that will laugh just as much at you for believing in in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth as believing in in biblical cosmology so science is already telling you modern day science is already saying look there's no evidence that there's a creator to the to the cosmos there's no evidence for that this this came out of a big bang or a spark from nothing or you know what have you and so they look upon you as ridiculous already yeah so you're you're already bucking the you know modern system so we're just asking to come one step further <laughs> and believe everything that the Bible says. Spend some time studying that second day of creation, Genesis 1, 6 through 8. Really dig into the words there in Hebrew. Um, yeah. Look at the definitions and uh, the context there in Genesis 1 and see, is, is Genesis 1 really talking about this ever-expanding universe? Or is Genesis 2, 4 correct when he says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished? Hmm. Yahweh completed everything, <laughs> yeah, you know, amen, and the, amen. and the earth is the focal point. I mean, even the lights in the heavens in, in Genesis 1, 14 through 19, it said that the lights, the two great lights, the sun and the moon, as well as the stars, they are placed in the firmament to give light where on the earth mm-hmm. where we live. So Yahweh's not dealing with, you know, all these other worlds or possible life forms or whatever. Yahweh's not dealing with any of that. This is this is it. This is his creation. This this enclosed place is special to him. And that's what Genesis one is is all about. Yeah, I love you speaking of the sun and the moon and the stars and all that. Um, a book. I, I know you've read it and are familiar with it. Um, Je- the book of Jubilees, mm-hmm. chapter two. I love the the details in that chapter to me are amazing because it does tell us um that when the sun, moon, and stars were created on the fourth day, uh, it was three kinds that were created. Mm. Kinds were created. You got your sun, you got your moon, and you got your stars. Three separate kinds, right? What does science today tell us the sun is? A star, mm. right? It's mm. not true. It's just mm. not true. It's That would make it a kind with the stars. Then mm-hmm. you only created two things, right? A small, minute detail, but an important one to, to see the differentiation between kinds. Because, again, modern science wants us to believe things that don't jibe with what the scriptures have stated. Yeah, yeah. Right? And the more that we listen to that narrative, it's going to drag us away from putting our faith in the narrative of scripture. And, you know, that that's the danger. That's That's kind of like the fine line we walk as Christians is in our modern society is, um, you know, this book has become more and more irrelevant. It's become more and more chalked up as metaphor, poetry, Mm -hmm. just an old ancient text. We can't, if we can't trust the cosmology, what, what else are we not going to be able to trust? There was no resurrection. We, science can't prove that the resurrection is real. Therefore, Christ, like was Christ really, was he the son of God or was he just some crazy, you know, it's just more and more devolves. Yeah. spirals into this like yeah this this um withdrawn um perspective in your faith and i know i know people myself who have gone that way who who grew up in christian homes you know learning the scriptures and knowing their bibles and you know, being able to parrot back verses at, during sunday school and at like vacation bible school and then they go into university yeah and then they come out mocking the bible and then yeah. they're just gone and yeah. i'm just like this is you know so th- that's why we have to champion this stuff matthew yeah. we have to this is why i'm glad that someone like yourself was able mm-hmm. to to take on this challenge of such a, a, a divisive if i'm honest divisive topic within mm-hmm. not just the body of believers but in the world in general mm-hmm. um and you've done your due diligence and you've come to a, a, an understanding that you're going to take hold of and run with and yes. you're going to profess it. Right. Oh, yes. Need, oh, need yes. More people boldly professing this stuff. Yes. Because it what it will bring more people back in. Even atheists, atheists are coming to because they're seeing they're testing. They're seeing that the science that isn't corrupt and isn't part of this whole corrupt um, world system actually does prove what the scriptures say yes we are being able to see way too far 
You know, we are like there's a, there's a lot of things that do, do validate um, scientifically what the scriptures have always said. Yes. And so I'm just I'm happy that someone like yourself, who's influential, who people respect uh, and hold high esteem, are gonna you know they'll they'll pass your documentary on and people will listen. And so the the you know we're gonna win this battle back. That's the plan. I'm hoping. Um, yes. You know that's part of my ministry, and I know it's part of your ministry is to. To win people to Christ, to win them to the good news of the gospel message of his kingdom. And his kingdom, literally, is part of this creation model. And if yes. you don't believe the creation model, don't understand what it says and, and how the Bible actually portrays it, then you won't even you're gonna you're you're gonna believe that the kingdom is something completely different than what it, what Christ himself actually taught that it was. So yeah. First page, man. First page of the Bible. People say, yeah. does it matter? It's on the very first page. Brother Ken said something in a discussion years ago that this is the father setting his stage. When I used to sing, Brother, Brother Ken played one of the songs that I co-wrote um, with the band August Rain, and we, we would sing and we would set up, and it would take a couple, two or three hours to set up the stage and get everything ready for the show. It was very important. We took care, every light, every little instrument, everything had to be in the right spot. Mm -hmm. So that when it when the time came for the hour show, which was less time than the setting up, everything just went smooth. And that's what the father's doing in Genesis one. He's setting the stage. Uh, so cosmology is in, is in the Bible. It matters. Um, why would we say what does it matter? What difference does it make? Why would we even say that? about Yahweh, our creator and his creation. Nobody ever said it about the heliocentric model. Mm -hmm. Whenever any, anybody taught heliocentricity, nobody ever said, well, what difference does it make? Ah, this doesn't matter. Nobody said it then. Yeah. And uh, so yeah, it, it definitely matters. Going back to those lights you mentioned, notice it's lights, not one light and one rock. Yeah. yeah it's exactly. two great lights. Now it's a greater light and a lesser light. Um, and people try to, they try to metaphor the, the light of the moon, but they, they take literally the light of the sun, Yeah. <laughs> but it says lights, plural, yeah. both the sun and the moon. So the moon is a light. It is not a rock. It, it shines forth its light. That's what Genesis one teaches. Yeah, so. exactly. Let's go, you know what? Let's go to Genesis one real quick there, brother. Yeah. Let's pull some of this stuff up here. Okay. So we've mentioned these verses a couple times. Let's let's just read it. I'm going to read it. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. Hmm. Now, Matthew, I personally, like, while I do like the, like, this is, the LSB is the Legacy Standard Bible. Mm-hmm which is a derivative of the NASB. Right. I do like that the scholarship behind that translation. I, where I don't like it, and I'm sure you know why, is where they use this kind of, it's shrouded in mystery, this word expanse, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's, it's not straightforward to what the actual Hebrew and the Greek, um, how it's portrayed in those languages, right? Correct. It's too generic. It's too obscure. Um, Correct. Now, when we go to different translations, and I'm sure you've seen this in your studies, this is what we get for the word rakia, right? Mm -hmm. Expanse, firmament, canopy, dome, space, mm -hmm. vault, sky, and horizon. Mm -hmm. The majority of them say expanse mm -hmm. because it's it's more modern, right? It's more it's just easier. It skirts uh, any scrutiny from from people thinking like, wait a minute, why would you use the word firmament? That's too archaic yeah. you can't you can't say that there's a little structure right so we're going to use this word expanse yeah and this is what i try to tell my audience matthew is that we can't rely on translators um 100 while right. they while they are clearly in love with the word trying their hardest to provide us with translations that come as close to the original languages i mean depending on which which translator and translation obviously but mm -hmm. they try they try you know they do their due diligence with this stuff but they still bring their biases to these texts mm -hmm. we see mm -hmm. translator biases a lot and you've i we've discussed this even when we uh went over the trinity when years ago matthew and i for those who don't know we discussed the trinity yes um 
I mean, there's Trinitarian bias in lots of versions. And so it's just, you, you can't get away from it, is what I'm saying. Be a Berean, be a, you know, someone who goes to the languages yourself, and look mm -hmm. at the words, use lexicons, concordances, and come to the determination of what, what the words are and how they are used in the context, right? And go from there. Don't place your, your hopes and your faith in men who translate, even though they do a good job. Mm -hmm. It's not a perfect job. That's, That's what right. I'm getting at. Sure. No perfect translation. Just as a side note, two of the most respected scholarly translations on the market today, New Revised Standard Version, Lexham English Bible, which is, yeah. I think Heiser was behind that and the Logos Bible software. Lexham says vaulted dome. Yeah. New Revised Standard Dome. I love that version, the Lexham English. Yeah, I mean, yeah. so these are. This is not some paraphrase, tiddlywink versions here. These are recognized scholarly versions of the Bible, and both of them use dome, which I think is a is a good modern way to describe the the Rakia. Um, like I said, look up Rakia in uh, Wilhelm Jacinius's uh, the Halot Theological Dictionary uh, of the Old Testament. They'll all tell you. Rakia refers to a solid structure, a dome-like structure over top of the earth that can actually separate waters. Genesis 1, 6 yeah. through 8. I never studied Genesis 1, 6 through 8. I'm 42 years old. I never studied Genesis 1, 6 through 8 until the last couple of years. Hmm. And it blew me away. Psalm 148, 4 corroborates the prayer of Azariah or Daniel chapter three, verse 60 in the yeah. Septuagint. I got the that one on the, on the screen. We're going to get to it. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's there in Genesis, but it, the second day of creation, it's like the, it's like the day that doesn't ever get spoken about. Yeah, it really is. It, nobody ever talks about the second no. day unless, unless you're Ken Heidebrecht. <laughs> <laughs> and now Matthew, Jansen. Matthew Jansen. Yes. Yeah. And others. Yeah, exactly. But it's, it, you, that's what you need to center in on. That's what, I guess that was another aha moment for me from the scriptures was taking Genesis one, six through eight, literally. Yeah. Um, this is a literal creation. I'm, I'm going to take this literally and believe that Yahweh really did put a dome, an arc dome to separate the waters. So you have waters above the dome and waters underneath the dome. And then eventually the waters underneath the dome, he lets them gather into one place and the dry land appears. I think that's on a, on a, uh, maybe day three or, or, or f further on there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I love it. It's amazing. It really is. I love it. And um, so firmament comes from the Latin firmamentum. And that it means that which strengthens or supports and to prop up, right? This description, Matthew, does it sound like a wispy nothing no -ness? no it sounds like a structure right yes like i mean have to be 100 yeah firmamentum in latin stereoma in greek rakia yeah. in hebrew coming from the root word raka there you go yeah. you got the hebrew and extended surface i forgot brown drivers and briggs you can pull that up on your esort app or whatever app you're using and brown drivers and briggs will tell you um, that it means uh, a solid structure, the, the yeah. word rakia. Coming from raka, which I think means like to beat, yeah, to stamp out into metal plates. <laughs> yeah. And you can you can go through the Tanakh, you can look at all the uses of these words, raka, which is the base word, and then rakia, and you'll, you'll come to this conclusion. I mean, this is what it's referring to. This is not something Matthew and, and Ken are making up. We didn't just come up with this in our bedroom last night because we wanted to be different. <laughs> this is what the Hebrew word means. This is what scholarship across the board. And, you know, scholars disagree on most things most of the time. But like on this subject, it's like across the board. This yeah. is they'll say, yeah, this is what the word means. This is what the Hebrews believed. Yeah, exactly. It's established lexiconical yeah. definitions like are there for a reason. And that's that's how it comes up. Um what else we got here, brother? So this mm. is this is uh you mentioned him earlier. You want to yeah. read this? Yes. So this is Paul Seeley. He's right at the beginning of my documentary. Mm -hmm. Um, 20 years he studied Genesis 1 through 11. This I think was the most profound uh statement in his part one. Quote, there is not a single piece of evidence in the old testament to support the conservative belief that the Rakia was not solid. 
going on down. The historical grammatical meaning of rakia in Genesis 1, 6 through 8 is very clearly a literally solid firmament, end of quote. Yeah, it's like shooting a bazooka at his colleagues. Some of his colleagues that, <laughs> that would rather it say expanse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but I'm telling you, um, you can you can pull up if you just Google Paul Seeley, the firmament and the water. You can pull up both parts, part one and part two of his studies. I highly recommend that you read them. He's basically doing what Ken and I are doing right now, just in written form. He's going over the text. He's showing you the, the lexical definitions. He's going over the scriptures. He's giving you some historical corroboration. Um, yeah. Just just a great piece of scholarship there by Mr. Seeley. Yeah, it's amazing. We yeah. got another one here. You want to read that one off too? This yeah. was also in your documentary. Yeah, this one is from um, Manfred Gorg. I believe he, he uh, put this entry in. He states here, in uh, Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, quote, Rakia denotes a stable, solid entity situated above the earth, which protects the living world from an influx of the waters of chaos. The noun bears the connotation compact, firm, so that translations, catch this, so that translations such as expanse miss the mark. This is the heavy hitter. This is what all, you know, the big guys in seminary are using, the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. I didn't put this one in my documentary because you eventually just have to say, you know, you got to stop somewhere. Right. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Let me, let me show you a couple more. I, I won't open these up. But here is the urban's dictionary of early Judaism. This one didn't go in my documentary. This one's in my library. Look under cosmology it says the exact same thing we've been saying that, you know, during this broadcast here. And then I have an older one here in my library the encyclopedic dictionary of the Bible. I'm going to do a, a video, a standalone video just on the entry for firmament in this particular dictionary. It's cool. phenomenal. It says the exact same thing, just expounds on it a little bit more of what we've been saying here. Like I said, brother Ken, I was amazed when I went to my library and pulled these books up. Some of these books I've had for over 20 years, but I've, I've just never studied about the firmament. Yeah. So they've been sitting on my shelf this whole time. Um, but that's that book you just had there. looks like you could do some serious curling action there. And, yes. Yeah. You know, you, you work on your, your physical strength as well as your, uh, your biblical strength. Right. It's great. It, it was, it's, it's heavy. You could definitely kill a fly with it. That's for sure. <laughs> A very slow fly with probably yeah. no wings, but yeah. Yeah. So, but this, this was, it was fascinating to me, man. It just, uh, it just really was when I got to looking at, uh, two, two ancient historians, Josephus and Philo, they mm -hmm. both believe this in their, in their treatise on Genesis, when they're explaining their belief on, on the firmament, they both believe it's a solid structure. Josephus even says he believed it was made out of crystalline, made out of yep. crystal. Yeah. You know, I think you so, probably get that from Ezekiel. Yes, Ezekiel well, chapter Ezekiel one. Ezekiel sees underneath Yahweh's throne an expanse, a crystalline expanse, right? Yep. So he's he likes, yeah, crystal, crystalline is it's interesting. I know you've you've looked into that too, and uh, just yeah. the color blue. You know, when we look up at the sky and we uh -huh. see blue, right? It, it's interesting just because crystalline has that kind of bluish property. It can, it yes. can have that. Yes. So it makes you wonder what, what you're really looking up at the sky in the blue na uh, nature. What that is really? Yeah. It's great. Yeah, it's great. What else we got here? Okay. So I figured I would put Genesis 1 8 on the Septuagint real quick, where it says, yes. And God called the firmament heaven, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So, Matthew, not to put you like, you know, in the hot spot here. Sure, right? sure. Do you see anything different in this version compared to the Masoretic text? And God called the firmament heaven. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Brother Ken, it's not right now. It's not jumping off the page at me. Right. Show me. What's interesting here is the Masoretic text leaves out, and God saw that it was good. Oh, so wow. God doesn't call the firmament good in the Masoretic text version, which is interesting because when you go through all the days, you know, all the days are good except mm. for day two. Day two is not good, but in the Septuagint, it is. Wow. I love it. I love it. It's interesting because he, he thinks it's good, right? I mean, he Thank called you. this structure that he created good and he called it heaven, which I think also is important to highlight. Um, yes. Yes. You know, that he actually named this structure. It's got yes. a name. Heaven. Yes. 
It's a good nugget. Yeah, I love it. So you sent me this visual. And, uh, I mean, it, there's several depictions of ancient cosmology. Uh, sure. This is a neat one, for sure. Well, this one's from John R. Roberts. It's the scholar that studies Genesis. But what what I, this one's in the documentary, but what is so powerful about this is this article is like a 50 plus page article about cosmology and Bible translation. And if you look at the top, for those who want to translate Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 from the Hebrew into another language, the UBS translators handbook on Genesis all right, so this is the handbook. UBS stands for United Bible Society. This is the handbook that they're giving the translators that are specifically working on Genesis. And it says they are advised to study the picture of the universe given here in figure one and to look at all of these relevant passages and the relevant articles in, in Bible dictionaries. The reason is because they know this is what the Bible teaches. Yeah. I, I mean... To me, it's a slam dunk case. End of discussion. To to me, I mean, it it, it's, it doesn't make any sense for them to be pushing this for Bible translation if these people that study ancient Near Eastern culture, because remember the Tanakh, the old older Testament, you it was written in a culture. It's just like nowadays in twenty twenty three, you know, unless you understand the culture, you won't understand some words that the young people especially use. I've caught, I, I, I've started using it now. They, I've heard them use it so much, but when uh, 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 a certain dish of food is good, they say that was bussing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have, I have five children and four of them are t over 20 years old and I hear them say it. So now my wife, she'll cook dinner and I'll say, honey, that was bussing. <laughs> nice. Well, if you don't know the culture, you won't know what the word means. I mean, yeah. when I grew up, we would say, you know, something was cool. You know, if, if, if it was, uh, if we liked it or if it was neat or something like that, but we'd use the word cool and you, you have to know the culture. The, the Tanakh wasn't written in a vacuum. It was written in, in an ancient near Eastern culture. So it's like Heiser was saying in his article about, I mean, in his video earlier, um, Genesis has a different theological framework, but if you read like the Babylonian creation uh, account in the Enuma Elish, um, it, it, there's the same cosmology there. I don't think that Moshe or the author of Genesis is borrowing from the Enuma Elish. I think that there is, there is, there is a shared cosmology from the people that lived at that time. Mm -hmm. And Genesis is saying what, what the author of Genesis is saying is that, the firmament wasn't made because Marduk won the battle with Tiamat and then filleted her body and used half of it to make the firmament. No, no, there was no battle. Yahweh created the firmament. Yahweh yeah. is the one who made this structure over our heads. So the theological framework is different, but the, the understanding of cosmology is shared. It's, it, it, Genesis doesn't try to change anything when it comes to cosmology. And it's because it's true, brothers and sisters. It's mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. yeah that's amazing man it's yeah again like satan doesn't want us to know about this firmament no. you know i, I no. feel like that the firmament obviously just completely shatters a lot of uh, lies in this world like if you can if you believe that there is a literal encasement around us ex instead of an ever expanding nothing random chaotic um big bang you know mm-hmm existence mm -hmm. you're just yeah it's it's crazy i can go on about that but um i'm gonna pull this up here so i want to ask you yeah. and, and this is this is maybe a little rhetoric but um can yahweh lie matthew no he the book of hebrews says it's it's impossible for yahweh to lie right it's part of what makes him yahweh that he can't tell a lie okay so that wouldn't that shatter completely the foundation of the doctrine of accommodation then 100 percent, brother i considered that in my studies i did consider that because that's a pr pretty common view um but i i asked myself all right am i going to believe this is what scripture teaches and then it's just he's just accommodating the ancient hebrews and, he, and he's you know not really worried about if they believe wrong or or, or am i going to just believe that yahweh meant what he said 
and yeah. and I and I chose that. I chose. I, I I'm just going to believe Yahweh meant what He said. He inspired the authors to write what they wrote. Um, and I I don't I don't have a problem with the doctrine of accommodation in this sense that Yahweh speaks things to us through Scripture that we can understand. I have no problem with that. For instance, he likens the firmament to uh, a tent in mm -hmm. Isaiah 40, verse 22. He doesn't say it is a tent, but he said it's like a tent. Okay, so that's that's accommodation in trying to get us to understand what's going on up above our heads. But what that means is, is that whatever the rakia or the firmament is, is similar to what we see when we get inside of a dome tent, you know, maybe yeah. for the Feast of Tabernacles yeah. <laughs> and we've got a flat ground and a dome or a roof. Yeah. Over and it's like, head. it's like Moshe who received the, uh, the pattern, right? The copy of the, uh, the mm -hmm. tabernacle in heaven. Mm -hmm. He was told to follow precisely the pattern that was revealed to him on the mountain because it a copy and a shadow of what exists literally up there. Yes. So he had to follow it to the T because he Yahweh, in my opinion, wanted them and us in the future, obviously, yes, to play house, to play, you know, to practice his ways, to, yes. to you know, engage in his reality where he exists down here on the earth. And so I agree. He he needs to use similes and, and metaphors sure. for sure. us to like, you know, wrap our minds around this, but it doesn't remove the literal nature of no. what he is trying to meta like, you know, what he's comparing and contrasting these things from right but, all right let's go to the one more slide here i think yeah i yeah. pulled this I, I sent this one to you i can't remember her last name her first name is samantha samantha if you're if you're watching may yahweh bless you for the time and the effort you put into this this was my favorite illustration that i used in the documentary mm -hmm. i just thought it was beautiful um, it's hard to read on the screen, some of the, you know, the writing, but you could go through the writing and she basically just brings up a lot of the scriptures we've already touched on, um, 140 verses there at the bottom, but I just thought she did such a great job with this. And, um, I think it's in the documentary five or six second clip, uh, towards the beginning of it. Yeah. I like the, uh, the flat broad plane where revelation 20 and they marched up over the breadth of the earth and encircled the camp of the saints and the city having been beloved, but fire came down out of heaven and devoured them. So this this concept of it being the breadth of the earth, right? It's a plane. Yeah. And, it, and there's there's scriptures that talk about how on the day of the Lord, the mountains are going to crumble down. The valleys yeah. are going to be raised up to set, right? He's 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 providing a, a landscape for the nations who survive this great and terrible day to be able to traverse to the new Jerusalem when it comes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. to me, that's like, okay, not only he, he's literally making a pancake, like he's, he's removing all obstacles so that people can mm -hmm. get there and they'll be able to see this thing everywhere on the earth, which is kind of hard if we're on a ball, right? Like if the new mm -hmm. Jerusalem sets down and we're on a ball, mm -hmm. what about the one, you know, the ones that are on the bottom side of the ball, how are they able to see that new Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be able to see that. No, no, no. Little things like that, that you just, you can't make sense of it unless you understand that the Bible is literally trying to tell you what the setting is. And then when you come to these scriptures, you don't have to metaphorize them or allegorize them and put them in the, in the bin of obscurity because you, you can't believe it because modern science says otherwise, right? You, all of a sudden they fit in like a big puzzle piece, right? There's all yeah. these little pieces and it's like, Oh, here's the big picture. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah. I mean, we could, do you want to go through a couple of these or do you want to, Move on we can move bit. on. We can okay. move on. It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. So this is an, another neat little little mm. meme that I picked up. It's not even about the shape of the earth anymore. It's about whether or not people can accept the Bible as absolute truth, right? I mean, then it's... I love it. It's true. I mean, we yeah. can't just take these verses and as believers and, and just discard them and say, eh, irrelevant, doctrine of accommodation. Mm -hmm. They either say what they mean or they don't. Mm. You know, and it's it's amazing. I mean, the, the circle of the earth one, Isaiah forty twenty two. I, I I used to use that one actually to yeah to talk about um, God and and how the Bible is scientific. You know, to, to <laughs> unbelievers, and I was like, hey, look, the circle of the earth is it's a globe right here, man. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. they knew about the globe way back then. Like mm. you know, yeah. 
I tried my best with what I had at the time, right? And then you come right. to realize that this is no, no, no. The circle it was inscribed. Right? Yes, a compass. The Hebrew compass. is often translated as compass. There, um, uh, chug, I believe, is the Hebrew word. Yep. And then the the B part of the verse, same verse. Um, he sp speaks of the inhabitants of the earth are like grasshoppers, and then he he stretched the heavens like a tent to dwell in. Same verse. Yep. So it's referring to a circular base and a dome over top Isaiah 40, 22 is actually goes in, in our favor. It doesn't go in the heliocentric globe favor. Yeah, for sure. So here's another graphic I found randomly. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool personally, but um, <laughs> <laughs> a yeah. little shameless plug, of course, but yes, uh, yes. you know, for those who have followed my channel for a little bit of time, they they've probably come across this graphic and this, this, took some time to put together and this was years of studying the scriptures and ancient cosmology and uh matthew yes i'd love to pick your brain sure. in maybe a future episode either on your channel or over here again mm -hmm. just about the, the underworld yes a yes a little we, bit Be yeah, yeah studying I'm, about it i'm actually preaching on first samuel 28 yeah uh, i, I saw you habit, so yeah i saw you post um stuff about it and it got me intrigued again i got these feelings again about you know, it, it was it was reminiscent, a little nostalgic back when you started posting things about flat earth or biblical mm -hmm. cosmology. I was like, oh, is he going that direction? <laughs> now, I know you and I have discussed kind of in the past what happens when we die, you know, sure. and all that stuff. So I'd be interested to see kind of if this understanding of biblical cosmology, which includes the underworld below Sheol mm -hmm. and its mm -hmm. compartments and all of that has changed your mind on anything or, you know. Yeah, think, I'm looking. I'm currently looking into it. Um, so. Just real briefly, I do think that the witch of Endor called up Samuel from the grave. I think that Samuel, yeah. you know, was was talking to him um, and he, he said, why have you disquieted me? Why have you disturbed me? So I think he was resting in Sheol <laughs> and he was like, dude, why'd you why'd you wake me up? Why'd you bring me up here to to talk to you? So Sheol in the in the Hebrew Bible, it looks like sometimes it just refers to the grave or grave them, but sometimes it refers to the underworld. I, I think the text in Numbers with Korah and his followers, where the earth opens up, swallows them alive, and they go down into Sheol. I, I think that's a good verse to to show that. So I'm in the process of re-examining some of what I believe about what happens when you die. Cool. Um, we we yeah. both we, we both let's say this agree that when a person dies, they they don't go straight to heaven or go to burn in, in, in the, uh, second death. <laughs> yeah. So, yep. yeah. yeah, it's cool, man. Yeah. Another feature episode. Per perhaps we can do that. That'd be great. Yeah. Kingdom in context is in the house here, Matthew saying now what's happening in that temple at the top of those firmaments. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so this is Sean. Like this, <laughs> bless his brother. I mean, he, he's, he's helped me so much in my walk and, oh, he's um, a great brother. you know, this is a great question. What is our high priest doing? in the tabernacle above, yeah. you know, what, what is he actually doing? Is he just sitting at the right hand of the father, just kind of twiddling his thumbs, waiting all these years, or is he an actual priest in some sort of manner? You know, is he doing something? Intriguing question. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's see here. So, yeah, so this visual here, man, um, you know, and we don't have to really discuss this, but obviously I've, I've got a few more firmaments, than the traditional sure sure visual yeah. kind of shows and that that comes from my understanding um you know not just extra biblical texts what we would call extra biblical texts but i, I see this in genesis one um you know mm -hmm. in the beginning god created the heavens the shemaim heavens plural and the earth and because we know that the firmament is called heaven to me that would imply that there's multiple firmaments multiple right. heavens and um the book of Jubilees mentions how on day one, Yahweh created the heavens above and yes. then the earth. And then he goes to day two and says he created the firmament, called it heaven. Um, also, the uh, the Testament of Levi, which is part of the Testament of the 12 patriarchs, has him. And that I, I do subscribe to those, um, mm -hmm. the validity of those texts. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I think actually we, we might have had you on Honor Kings with that one, did we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. remember that one? Testament of Levi, I think we talked yeah. about. And for those of you that are just familiar with the New Testament, I think in one of the epistles to the Corinthians, Paul talks about how he was caught up to the third heaven. 
Yeah. So and that's, I use that one too in Second Corinthians twelve. Right? Yeah. So there, that that yeah. text would prove that there was at least three. It wouldn't negate that there were more, but it would prove that there was at least three there. Yeah. So there's something to this. Irenaeus believed in the seven heavens. He um, did. Yeah. The, the, a lot of the Jewish writings would talk about seven heavens as well. So um, yeah, there's definitely validity to that, brother Ken. I, I haven't I haven't studied it. Um, in depth as yourself, but um, I'm familiar with, with the graphic. I'm familiar with what you're saying. Yeah. Awesome, man. Okay. I uh, think we touched on something. Uh, Matthew, I wanted to pull this one up. This was really cool. Yes. Genesis seven eleven in the Septuagint says in the 600th year of the life of Noah in the second month on the 27th day of the month on this day, all the fountains of the abyss were broken up mm -hmm. and the floodgates of heaven were opened yes so i like this version because it, it mentions the actual abyss which J jubilees chapter two says that god created on day one mm -hmm. he made these abysses right these cavernous areas below and this is where we have the waters below right the great depths the great yes. deep and genesis um, one two darkness yeah. was upon the face of the deep yeah <laughs> yeah and so the floodgates, Matthew, is, is kind of another thing I wanted to highlight here. What's yes. interesting about the floodgates here is when you pull up the Hebrew, it's it's Aruba, Bahama, come on, pretty mama. You know, that's an easy one for me to remember. <laughs> it means a lattice, window, sluice, and floodgates. Yes. So do you know who uh, Brother Josh Keep is over at Founded Earth Brothers? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. He was talking about... He honed in on this word sluice, and I hadn't looked at it until he mentioned it. Mm -hmm. And do you know what a sluice is? No, but in my studies, I kept coming across that word, but I just never thought. Sometimes it just you know goes in one ear and out the other. Yeah. So no, I I'm, I haven't looked it up. That's what a sluice is. Mm. So it's a it's like a door that holds waters, and when it mm. opens, it allows the waters to flood through, and then it closes. So it's like a dam, like a, a retractable dam there. Yeah. yeah. So wow. that, that, that's what the father's saying that he created into his firmament structure, yes. which would make sense because, I mean, I'm sure he could flood the earth with rain, you know, clouds and all that. It would probably take quite a while for that, but mm -hmm. it seemed like he was pretty like ardent to get this judgment on the way. Right. So he mm -hmm. breaks up the great fountains of the great deep. He opens yep. up the sluices of the firmament and just the waters that are above as we've established already. Yeah just come flooding down that would have been quite an amazing yeah. sight to see yeah that's one of the things i really want to see when we get to the kingdom you know the replay of the flood i want to kind of want to see that to be honest i didn't um, understand this until biblical cosmology i didn't i didn't I, 10 years ago if somebody would ask me you know about the flood i thought well it just rained for 40 days and 40 nights but that what ken's saying is this this is what happened the great deep came up the waters above the firmament came down that's why it flooded the entire earth. Yeah. Plus it makes more sense to flood the earth. If it's enclosed cosmology, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense on a globe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It really doesn't. <laughs> so, um, so as Michael Heiser said in his little presentation, you know, as he read this, praise him, you heaven of heavens and you waters above the heavens. That's in a post flood setting. That's yes. quite some time away from the flood. Yes. And so that would imply that there's still these waters above the firmament. They yes. didn't just go away. There wasn't some sort of an ice canopy that en encapsulated the earth and then no. shattered, broke down, and all the waters came down and there's nothing left. Right. right. This would imply there's still waters above. Right. And not only does the psalmist say that, but as you mentioned earlier, our brother Azariah and his companions when they were thrown into the fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow to the, uh, the statue. Yeah. They decided, Hey, we're going to, you know, we we're going to trust the father. They were tossed in and this is recorded. This is in the Septuagint. If you guys don't know this, this was yes. included in the Septuagint, not in our Masoretic text. Um, as is praying, praising the father while he's walking amidst the flames untouched. And he's saying, bless the Lord, all waters above the heaven. Mm. Sing praise to him and highly exalt him forever. So that's our second witness, right? People want to use the second witness stuff. And this would be another one. It corroborates what the uh, the psalmist said okay. about the existence of the waters above. Amen. Okay.
Yeah, it's amazing. Now, Matthew, that's all I have for slides tonight. We're uh, we're over an hour. I told my wife we'd be an hour, and of course, uh, we went over. I'm in overtime. <laughs> <laughs> no, overtime. that's that's good. That's that's really good. Um, I tell you what, if you don't mind, I would like to just point out a couple of my favorite testimonies from the documentary. Let's do not, it. Yeah, you know, not that I didn't appreciate everybody's uh, entry. Some of them came in late, and I was you know able to clip them in there there at the end. But some of my favorite ones were uh, Brother Sean Davis. Um, mm -hmm. He used to be an atheist. And he, he said in his testimony that when he realized that roof, he called it the roof <laughs> above us, he could no longer deny that, you know, there was a creator that made all of this. Um, so I enjoyed that one. Yeah, um, awesome. Sister Sister Carla Malberg, I think she she was on here um, She's earlier. She's in the chat somewhere, yeah. And her, hers, I, I remember when I was editing hers, putting hers together, I was just crying the whole time. She just seems such so honest and serious. And she talked about how that she went outside one night, looked up, and she realized Yahweh's right there. He's mm -hmm. he's right up above me. You know, he can see me. Um, not like modern science claims where he's, you know, a gazillion miles away, light years away, but he can see me. And that one just really touched me. I couldn't get through it without without crying. I think I tear up every time that I that I watch it. Yeah. Um, so those those two really really stuck out to me and really were tugging on the heartstrings when I was putting them together. Mm. And so I want to thank mm -hmm. Brother Sean and, and Sister Carla uh, for that. And then one more at the very end. She was the last one at the end. It was Sister Rebecca Thomas. And she made a statement that was just a general statement about seeking truth. And I would like to repeat that statement here. She said this. She said, I would say the key to drawing closer to our creator is to never be complacent in our walk. Never think you have it all figured out. Never stop asking him for wisdom and seeking the truth in the scriptures. He will show you. He says he will. You just have to ask. Hmm. That's profound, Beautiful. and it Beautiful. reminds me of Matthew 7. Yeshua says, seek, ask, and knock, right? Yeah. You'll get the answers. The door will be open to you. Um, and he says that if, if, if us as human beings who sin give, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give, give good gifts to those who ask him? And yeah. so if you don't know, if you're watching, you're just not sure, um, take it to Yahweh in prayer. You don't not prayer apart from studying the scriptures, but prayer along with studying the scriptures. Take it to Yahweh in prayer and say, Father, I just want to know the truth. Wipe everything out of your mind. I just want to know the truth, Yahweh. Show mm. me your truth. And I and I believe He'll He'll lead and guide that honest, serious, contrite spirit uh, that you have there for that prayer. But I just Amen. wanted to mention some of those testimonials that just really touched my heart. Uh so glad that they got to be a part of the documentary. Mm, that's beautiful. Amen. And I, I concur. Like if, if you want to know, he'll, he'll reveal it to you. I similarly had that same, you know, outcry to my father back in 2012. And, um, I wanted to desperately know who he was, if he was truly real. Mm. Um, yeah. And definitely a pinnacle, uh, in my faith for sure. Was that, that moment of, desperation is what it was and yeah. uh yeah not to get into my testimony but yeah it's uh he does he's faithful mm -hmm. he'll if you truly want to know him you know and as paul says um in acts like yes yeah we put us all on the earth and we're all groping to know him and to, to reach towards him right? Mm -hmm. right that we may grasp onto him and he's, even though he's not really that far from us he says right Excellent. and that's true and i i echo the sentiment of sister carla where I, similarly yahweh was that much closer to me when i realized huh he's just in an apartment building and he's up a few <laughs> floors above me whoa all of a sudden the sin that oh. all that's uh, he's literally watching me he can you know what I mean? He's not yeah. outside the ever expanding universe, a wispy nothingness far removed. He's my father and he's at the top of the house. He's in the penthouse, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's beautiful. It's only brings people closer to the father. Doesn't separate. In my no. opinion, I haven't seen anybody say, yeah, they brought me away from the Lord. Now it's only draws you closer and rightfully yeah. so because it's his word and it's true. And that's what it's meant to do. Oh, I love it, brother. Yahweh is a loving father, brothers and sisters. Don't ever forget that. 
and I, I don't, I'm not trying to preach or anything, but I am a preacher and people need preach, to know preach. that Yahweh, Yahweh, not, not that Yeshua didn't love us. He did. Yeshua loved us. But John three sixteen says, Yahweh, the almighty God, Yahweh loved the world in this way yeah. that he gave his only begotten son. That's the father's love. He loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He doesn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked that die, but rather that they turn and repent of their ways. He loves you and wants that relationship with you. Seek his face, cry out to him. He'll not only show you this truth, he'll show you all kinds of truths in the scriptures. When you just give it, give the reins over to him, let go of the reins and let Yahweh have his way in your life. Mm. And he'll, he'll bless you abundantly. I mean, it, it, th things will happen that you never thought could happen when you do that and you say, Yahweh, I'm giving it over to you. Hallelujah. Yeah. That'll sell, brother. That'll sell. Yes. Perfect. Now, if there's any questions, Brother Matthew's willing to take some questions before we sign out here. So, guys, if you don't mind, if you have questions, put them in capitalization. That way it'll stand out a little bit easier for me. Even though I am at the bottom of the chat here, so maybe not necessary, but it just does help. Yeah, brother, it's been great. I really do appreciate you coming on. Um, it's been yes. too long, honestly. It's been too too many years for us to have had another exchange, you know, oh, like I this know. virtually. And I missed you, man, and I, I love you. And um, mm. there's just uh, a good cloud of witnesses on this earth, and you're one of them, in my opinion. You're you're uh you're highly esteemed in my my heart for sure thank you brother. um okay so we got alex Jemfrey here saying asking is yah omnipresent first scripture that comes to my mind is in the psalms um if i go up to heaven he's there if i make my bed in sheol he's yeah. there so i would say you just in a general sense yes that doesn't mean he doesn't live in a location you know, uh, Yeshua referred to my father, which is in heaven, I think around 16 times in the gospel of Matthew alone. So that is where he lives. But I think Proverbs 15 says his eyes are to and fro. It beholds the evil and the good. So in that sense, he's omnipresent in that you can't get anything by him. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like mom used to say, I got eyes in the back of my head <laughs> when we were little. So I think in that sense, he sees all and knows all. Yeah. Now, guys, if we if we can keep the questions relevant to biblical cosmology and maybe Matthew's documentary or just personal questions for Matthew regarding that um, testimony, um, that'd be highly encouraged. Yeah, because there, like, there's a bunch of random ones I'd prefer not to get into. But No, no. This happens. I, I was at a, a house church one time and they started off with some questions about the sermon. And three hours later, I guess they thought I was the Messianic Pope or something because they was at, <laughs> they were asking me every question under the sun. And I finally had to stop them. It was like midnight. I said, guys, I said, I got to because I was going to teach a double session the next day. I said, I got to go to bed. Yeah. But they grab you. I, it, you know, it's like in Acts 20 where they they stayed up all night asking questions to Apostle Paul. Um, I probably would have stayed up all night asking him questions too if an apostle was at my house. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. Alex Jeffrey, the guy who asked the question earlier, um, he's saying apologies if that was off topic. That's okay, brother. I have a video called um, What is the Spirit of God or Who is the Holy Spirit? Something like that. I, I make these videos, Matthew, and I can't remember the titles of my own videos sometimes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, brother, I, I talk about it in great detail uh, with the Holy, the whole Holy spirit and how, you know, the father spirit is and permeates all of creation. Yet he does have a tangible, literal, physical, spiritual body. Um, it, it all intertwines into that video. So if you're interested, go check that out. Yes, I mean. Blessed one, Matthew is saying, are the mountains laid low and valleys raised up to make a foundation for the new Jerusalem? Yeah, it makes sense to me. Um, I think I take that in both a literal and a metaphorical um, I agree with what the brother is saying here, um, but I also think it's it's a metaphor. John the Baptist talks about it uh, in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter three. And I think we can also see mountains being brought low is talking mm -hmm. about people that boast and are prideful. He'll bring them down. But the valleys are people that are humble. He'll bring them up. So I think there's a spiritual and a literal connotation to that particular text. Sure. Yeah. And I, I believe that, uh, yeah, the father is going to completely 
refashion this earth the topography all, all the mountains are going to be leveled and the valleys raised up to as i said earlier to accommodate kind of the nation's ability to get to the new jerusalem where there's no no hindrances um for them to get there i think that's part of it for sure oh man can you uh let me see here Matthew, are you getting that look yet? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, <laughs> it's been awesome. It's been a slice. I really do appreciate you guys hanging out with Matthew and I. Matthew's a he's such a gem. He's great. It's, it's mm -hmm. awesome to be able to get an hour and a half of his time. So if you did enjoy this, please hit the like button. Yes. Subscribe if you're new. Go check out Matthew's channel and his uh, his website. Again, they're in the video description below. Show him some love. Check out his new documentary. Um, hit that like button in the documentary. Leave some comments. Get that. We need to get the algorithms picking up on this topic because mm -hmm. it's highly censored. I'm really surprised that uh, a couple of my videos have somehow made it through the censorship. The, the gatekeepers, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're just, you know, they've allowed a little crack in the door for me to sneak through or if, if it's Yahweh's providence. You know what I mean? That's, that, right. This stuff, That's right. Because a lot of people, like and I get a lot of comments, from people saying wow a flat earth video i thought they were all gone like how did i come across this and i'm like i don't know father just keep it going i guess like that that's i think it's up to him whether or not this stuff sure. gets through for personally sure, but, sure. share it with share it with your family and friends i had a lot of people say they they're looking forward to sharing it um because it's it, it, it i tried to make it systematic and kind of elementary as well in the documentary so share it with people um, there's nothing in there that's, you know, really in your face. There's, uh, there's nothing real condemnatory. It's just laying out the facts. So share it far and wide. I don't say that because it's me. I say it because I think it'll be a good way to get your foot in the door about cosmology with your friends and your loved ones that may not want to listen, um, you know, to more preachy stuff. But yeah, I think, I think it'll, it'll touch them, especially the testimonies. Yeah, for sure. Brother, uh, are we going to be doing a musical collab, you and I? We need to. I we think we do. To. Yes. <laughs> I yeah. love I love music. I love to write songs. I'm a singer and a songwriter, and Brother Ken is as well. Brother Ken has put some beautiful, beautiful songs together in his albums. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we need to do that, Ken. I agree. We'll have to get on that. Thank you, Ken and Matthew, for sharing the truth about Yahweh's creation. You're welcome, Brother George. We will get you on. I have Definitely we'll get you on. Sister Mary Slattery, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Matthew. This was a great conversation. Shabbat Shalom. And Tyler saying this was bussin'. Perfect. <laughs> good outro. This was bussin'. Matthew, you're awesome. Thank I appreciate you. you. I'm so thankful that the Father's placed you in my life. Your uh, your encouragement to me and my family. And uh, mm. I just want to, you know, I want to bless you leaving this conversation saying continue doing your good works. Continue doing what you do. And uh yeah, Thank you, Brother Ken. May Yahweh bless you and your beautiful wife and your home. And and uh, yeah, you're a good friend, man. You you really are. I mean that from my from my heart. You're a good friend. You're a good man. Good brother. And I'm 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 a better man knowing you. And I'm so glad that I got to come on here and and just talk about this casually with you. Um, I look forward to making that song together one of these days and awesome. so <laughs> maybe it'll be a biblical creation themed song oh i'm working on one believe it or not maybe sure. i'll send you the lyrics i've got all right sounds good my friend <laughs> thank you so much guys thank you for the love and support um you guys are amazing I look forward to meeting you guys uh, in the future in the kingdom if not in the surf sometime and uh enjoy your sabbath if you're participating now or tomorrow or on a different calendar doing it whatever we're all participating we're all trying and it's awesome so keep I mean, trying keep I mean. keeping the father's commandments love your neighbor as yourself and all will be well shabbat shalom